Okay, good evening. Can you hear me fine? We have lots of spaces in the middle here still, so if you want to get up, fill in the middle. There's probably about 40 to 50 seats here. We also have it simulcast in 10 Evans. I will not be doing eye clickers for credit. However, I will ask for eye clicker. I will have eye clicker questions that I might ask you to vote on, uh, but it will not be for credit. Okay. So and the lectures will be uh, webcast. That having been said, occasionally there's been equipment malfunctions and there's been no webcast available. I'm not responsible for that. I don't like it when it happens. But anyway, so that's just a little warning there. Um, a couple times we've had the windows broken and the projector stolen over the weekends. Usually affects the 1A class, not the 1A L class. Um, but anyway, so a few things. My name is Mike Meehan. I will give the lectures for the lab class. Uh, in terms of the 1A class, I'm trying to coordinate that. I'll do it with exams, grades, things like that. The fun stuff, right? Anyway, we have a separate 1A, separate lab class. There are different GSIs that teach the lab, different GSIs that teach the discussion section. Okay? We have office hours. You've seen that posted on B Space. I posted the office hours for both 1A and 1A L GSIs. We have an office hour, one hour before each lab, except for Wednesday and Friday morning, because you should be in the 1A class then, okay? Syllabus, it's very useful to read. It has exam dates, things like that. Uh, right now, uh, we want you to avoid lab discussion conflicts. For, so for most labs, what will happen is you will work as a pair of students, and you will, for example, be working with some seawater. What you're going to do with the seawater, this is just general direction, and why we're trying to minimize you switching labs, is you're going to plate some seawater. We're going to look for some bioluminescent colonies. You're then going to streak those out so that we get nice isolated colonies, and you'll do that for a few weeks. And then we're going to pick one of these isolated colonies, which hopefully will consist of only one strain of bacterium. We'll take that strain of bacterium, and we'll do what's called PCR colony. What we're going to do is try to amplify that is make lots and lots and lots of particular stretch of DNA, in particular two genes. Well, if you're working as a pair and one person has to switch, what happens to the sample? Who gets it? Where does it go? Also, all the labs are completely full. So we don't really have the luxury of saying, sure, we can move you around whenever, okay? That having been said, we know there are times that you're really sick, you have to go see the doctor. We do kind of record that doctor's note, uh, and we can try to reschedule you. But we do labs Tuesday through Friday. Friday afternoon at 5 o'clock, my staff starts turning down the lab and setting up a completely new lab for Tuesday. So unlike chemistry, we can't have a make a lab at the end of the semester and say, here, do this lab you missed, okay? So um, if you need to do a one-time switch for emergency, things like that, there's some information on the syllabus, but please, please try to avoid that, okay? Um, it just makes a lot of difficulties when you do that, all right? Books, ninth edition of Campbell, uh, people have an email me, do I need to read it? Uh, it might be helpful, but you really don't need to do many things in life, okay? But there are typically, that's true. You don't even need to take exams, but there are consequences, okay? Like a score zero. So that happens, I do think it's helpful to read Campbell. Will I ask you a bunch of questions on the lab exam one and two from Campbell that wasn't covered in lecture 11? Probably not. I don't think I've ever asked more than two to five points ever on an exam that wasn't covered directly in lecture or the lab exercise, okay? So don't spend a ton of time reading Campbell. Don't read it, reread it six times and write extensive notes. It's not worth it. Focus instead on the lab lectures, the lab manual, things like that, okay? Various resources to help you. There's the Lab Course Reader. That's a series of lecture slides. It's been on BSpace for about a week now. It's available at Replica Copy in color. It'll be very useful to have this during lecture. Uh, you can try to recreate everything during lecture, but it's not gonna be real easy, okay? I do four per page. Um, Gives enough room sometimes to put notes right on this or just do it on blank paper. I know it's expensive because it's in color, okay? Um, but anyway, that's available for you to have. Uh, if you want to do really well, people always say, what can I do to really get that A? We'll go over study skills in a bit, but try to go through these slides and say, what do I think the focus or purpose of this image is? This image, this image, this image, okay? And if you do that, then when you come to lecture, you really will be better prepared, okay? So there's the lab lecture reader, lab exam reader. Um, it might be more than $4 now because I put 100 pages of lab exam one in there. So you have about 100 pages of lab exam one. Five examples, 100 minutes for each one, that's 500 minutes, that's what? Seven, eight, over eight hours worth, plus usually students do those. They grade them, and then they go back and study from them. So you easily have 30 to 40 hours worth of work to keep you busy. If at the end people say, gee, can you give me more examples yet? I'll push the six examples, seven examples, eight, but it gets to a point of diminishing returns, okay? And that is, the key thing about those exams, take them in the 100 minutes with a timer, and when time's up, stop. And if you say, oh my god, I only got through half of it, then you'll need to work a little bit on increasing your speed, okay? And I have lots of office hours, GSIs do, I'll go over problems with you, how to do genetics. It's most of the genetics that students have difficulty with. So we're here to help you, okay? Myself, the GSIs, um, been doing this for about 20 years, we've had a separate lab course for about five. So please take advantage of office hours. As we get closer to exams, I will have more and more of them. Okay, maybe six to eight office hours a week. Anyway, we'll talk about that. Pre-labs and worksheets. Every lab, including this week, so every lab, including this week, there's always a pre-lab. So you must train in a complete pre-lab at the start of lab. It's in the packet at Replica, it's also in space. All right, that pre-lab is required. You will take a quiz, five points, also at the start of lab. And then at the, during the lab, you'll work on a worksheet. And this worksheet, depending on the lab, maybe do at the end of lab, or the start of the next lab. It depends what you have to do on it. You have to do some data analysis, et cetera, then it'll be the next lab. For your grade, I know everyone's really concerned about the grades, et cetera. So for your grades, what will count towards your grade, point-wise, is lab exam one, which I believe I have to look, but I think it's March 20th, 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. That's nighttime. I would never give an exam at 6.30 in the morning. It just wouldn't work well. And I don't like this time, but it's the only time available to give it, unfortunately. So that's lab exam one. That's worth 100 points. Lab exam two will be worth 64 points, and that's on Wednesday, May 1st, 8 to 10 p.m. Again, I apologize for the late time. We actually had a much earlier time, but OCHEM said, we need to have time to give our exams, et cetera, et cetera. So we gave up the time that we had in order that OCHEM could schedule an exam. Uh, sorry. Uh, but otherwise, it was going to be really difficult, and they wanted to do uh, 9 to 11 p.m. And I just didn't think that was fair. So good question. Oh, or maybe this is something I have to double-check. So I will double-check on this, okay? All right. Um, in part because with OCHEM, we have switched these times and dates like seven times. So I'll verify that, okay? All right. Um, in part because... Okay, I'm by 1A, 1B, things like that, large classes, and it's a real struggle with the room. So I will verify exactly what time I have on this. I know we've had at least three different times and three different dates, okay? So I'll verify that with you, okay? Um, any questions about that? So this exam is worth 64 points. This exam is worth 100 points. And then what we'll count is we have 11 labs. And the 11 quiz scores, we will drop the lowest of those 11. So effectively, it becomes 10 because we drop the lowest. So that gives us 50 points. So at the
and I have total number of points here, and I plot it, and I say, hey, there's the A range, and there's the A minus, and there's the B plus, and there will be some students who are within a point or two of this next grade. And what we do is we consider them as potential bumps. Because I think, in fairness, we should look and see, um, should we give them the higher grade? That decision is made by the GSIs who teach lab. And what they will do is they will look at your pre-lab and worksheets, because these are not directly factored into your grade, right? You never saw them count towards the point total. But they'll look at these, they'll look at participation, things like that, and they'll make the judgment call. Is that clear? And the reason we do that is because there's always some groups of students, and I like to give the GSI the opportunity to have the input because they know you typically far better than I do. Any questions about that? Okay. Now, there's one thing that I do about the quiz scores that not many other courses do. Um, I think it's the fairest way to do it. I think I've convinced OCHEM to do it, but um, they may not. It's a lot of work, but this is what I do. I know for a fact that some of the GSIs write really hard quizzes and are really hard graders. And students in those sections will be doing worse on the quizzes than in those sections where GSIs write really easy quizzes and have easy grading. But I think that's really unfair to the students. So I see people shaking their heads. Is that not true? You've never had a class like that? Clearly, you've had lots of classes like that. So what I will do is at the end, since all the students take lab exam one and two, I can use that as a weighting factor here for the 25 lab sections. So what I will plot is the quiz scores here for each of the 25 sections versus how that section did on lab exam one and two. And I come up with a graph like this, and I do my best fit line. And maybe there's a section there, and they really kind of got uh, cheated. So what I will do is I will keep the same slope and just change the intercept so it goes through the easiest of the 25 sections. And what I do, therefore, is I add points to the remaining 24 sections to get them to fall upon that line. Okay? Is that clear? I think that's the fairest way to do it. So if you want to talk about this individually later, we can. But that's the fairest way to do it. Okay? Any questions about that? Yes? No? Okay, let's move on. Uh, exam dates, uh, yeah, I said 6.30 to 8 here and 8 to 10 on the slide, um, but I'll double check, okay? Um, there's no lab lecture on February 18th. It's a holiday. We will still have lab Tuesday through Friday, though. Okay? The option was we either had lab, didn't have lab that week, but then we would have lab the week of the lab exam, which I really didn't want to do. So that's why I said we'll have lab this week and then no lab the week of the lab exams, all right? Um, and what that lab will require you to do is watch the webcast from last fall and then come to lab Tuesday through Friday to do it. So, so if you're planning a vacation, realize that we do still have lab Tuesday through Friday. Any questions about that? You have the slides that I used last fall. So you can watch the webcast from last fall. You have the slides from last fall, okay? Lab requirements, again, I do want to stress this. I usually get lots of emails about is there a pre-lab the first week? Is there a quiz the first week? The answer is yes, yes, and yes, okay? All available on BSpace or Rubber Coffee. Um, bring your lab manual. Seems kind of obvious, but we have a lot of times students don't bring the lab manual. The lab manual is what will guide you through the lab. It has a list of what you do to do various steps, okay? So please bring it. Grades, that's how the grades are determined here, is just do this sort of thing. Now let's do, I had I to this. How, let's do the ratio, the ratio. Ratio of number of A's to number of F's. That's the ratio. Okay. A is one to one. We gave the same number of A's and B's. B is two to one, C is five to one, D is seven to one, and E is what we would all hope for, 500 to one, okay? Which of those do you think, A, B, C, D, or E? Those of you who think A, raise your hand. Good. No. Oh, one student. Those of you who think B? No one? How about C? Fair number of hands. How about D? Fair number of hands. How about E? The wishful thinkers. Uh, it's actually D. We give out seven times more A's than F's and D's combined, actually. Okay? So when you hear the rumors that, oh, it's impossible to pass the lab class, probably not true. Okay? Not many people fail. All right? So anyway, again, we're here to give as many A's as possible if you earn them. Uh, but you do have to earn them. Okay? Any questions? Um, if you have questions during lecture, just raise your hand. If I don't see you, shout out, something like that. Okay? Um, when I leave evaluation, students oftentimes say, you know, I'm not receptive to the questions. But I'm trying to encourage them because I keep saying any questions. BSpace resources, they're there listed. I put as many things as I could on there. How you register the iClickers is on BSpace. I've gotten lots of emails. Could I check to see if their iClickers working? When you vote, you should get a green light. If you don't see the green light, it didn't work, okay? So that's a quick way to tell. If you get a red light and your iClicker's not working, replace the batteries. Usually there's enough time during the voting to do that. If it still doesn't work, that means your iClicker's defective and you should probably replace it if you want those points, okay? Any questions about the iClicker stuff? I'm getting lots and lots of emails about it. Yes. So, so the question is, if you register the iClicker for Bio 1A, would it be registered for Bio 1AL? It would be, but I'm actually not going to, um, if I collect data, I don't have a receiver because the GSI didn't return it from 1A this morning, but I'm not going to give points for iClickers. Okay. So if I do collect them, I will never do the analysis, okay? If you registered your iClicker this past fall with your ID, it should be valid for any UCB course, okay? And the way the iClickers work, if you want to know, is when you vote, the receiver sees the number of your remote ID. It creates for me, effectively, an Excel file. And all it has in the Excel file is the remote ID number. It doesn't have anything about student name or anything. It just has the remote ID number, your first vote, your last vote, how long it took you, and then how many number of times you voted. <laughs> so far, so far, this semester, out of two votes, the record is 67 times. <laughs> I don't even know how to do that, but that's the record, so far. Now I'm sure someone's going to try to beat it. Again, the only thing I look at is the last vote. That's the only thing that matters to me, okay? Um, so when you ask me, did my iClicker work, and you send me your name, I have no idea what iClicker you have. I don't know until at the end, or halfway through, what I will do is I'll make a big file with all the IDs, and then I submit it to the iClicker company, and then they will come back and just say, this remote ID belongs to this student. So if you registered it in the last, since fall, it will be valid for all UC campuses, okay? Or I should say, certainly UCB, okay? Is that clear? Whoever asked the question? But again, I won't be giving points in 1A for that, okay? And if we don't get enough iClicker points in 1A, we'll make them up on the final, okay? So to be fair. Okay, so anyway, study resources. When we get to live exam one, I'll hold off hours. There's a bunch of reviews. Um, again, you have five sample exams. That's a lot of sample exams. There are actual exams I've given with the answers. For live exam two, when we get to that, there'll be a lot of resources as well. Um, last semester, we completely changed the format of live exam two. So prior to fall 2012, the lab exam consisted of actual dissections. Students would rotate through. We'd have 30 stations set up. If you minute 45, the time would go off. You had to rotate the next station. Pretty stressful. So starting last fall, what it consisted of was one written exam with color images, 
All the students take the same lab exam. There weren't 22 different lab exams every three hours, etc. So I have one sample in the exam reader from last fall. That's the only one I have because that's the only one I'm given. It takes us about 100 hours to shoot the images and make them really high quality. So in your exam reader, when you pick it up from a copy, it adds in black and white. You'll see that that's probably good enough for all but three or four questions. But again, to make it best for you, we will actually print in color. So you can go to B space and print out in color if you want. Okay? All right? I think there are a couple images that it's helpful to have it in color. All right? Is that clear? Okay. So studying techniques. I've had several students who stopped by saying, "How can I study? What should I do?" Um, you know, first off, I went over grades. Um, what I think is helpful is be really active in your learning. So take your lecture notes and rewrite them. Try to make a diagram of them. Try to take one day's lecture. It doesn't matter if it's this class, physics, or whatever. Try to take that one day's lecture and synthesize it into one piece of paper. One blank piece of paper. And if you can, try to incorporate some of the key points for some of the figures. One page. And then when you study for the exam, you have 13 pages you're studying from. And if you go and set them on a table like this, you can oftentimes see interconnections that you can't see when you're flipping through 100 pages of notes. The other thing is oftentimes when you're studying 100 pages of notes, you start at the same place each time. So by doing the pages, you can shuffle them around so you start at different locations. What's really helpful is take these 13 pages and make one master sheet. Then when you study for the final, you have one sheet like that. Now, when I was a student, I didn't necessarily do the best on each midterm, but I usually, in almost every class I took, I almost always had this highest score on the comprehensive exam. And in part because I did this sort of approach, which allowed me to see how it all integrated. Whether it was econ, math, or whatever, it usually worked well for me. Now, it may not work for you. I'm only giving general study advice. So, but I do think it's very helpful to do those diagrams and things like that. If you look at the lab manual, I have two pages on that. You'll see one diagram in there. I think it's page four or six. I've taken the lecture exam one and one A before. I've gotten 80% on that exam from that one page, that one set of diagrams. But I made them. It conveys a lot more information. If you make them, it will convey a lot more information. Form study groups. I think if he explains the material to her and she picks the different topics and explains it to him, it's really useful. So when you have those study groups, be very active in discussing materials. Okay. Try to mix up your study groups just a little bit. Maybe not your drinking buddies or that sort of thing. Um, one semester, I had five students come in and they all said, you know, our study groups were really positive, but you know, they didn't do so well. So I knew that each of these five students got F's on the exam. Not the best study group to be interacting with each other. One semester I did partition students out into different study groups, kind of looked at their GPA, tried to mix it up a little bit, got study rooms, gave questions, things like that. It was a ton of work. And in the end, three groups out of 100 groups I formed were still doing it. And that was for about over 100 hours of work on my part. So I think it's better to form your study groups on your own. They'll probably last longer, okay? Um, office hours, I have three office hours a week. Again, as we get closer to exams, I'll have more. Every exam in the exam reader has the answers to it with explanations, okay? Um, so with this, uh, we have a little time. What are some properties of life? Uh, as Dr. Dowdle mentioned, they can reproduce, okay? Well, certainly they can obtain and convert energy, but some other things can do that. Undergo metabolism, which is pretty much all the chemical reactions that occur in a cell. You know, living things are composed of cells. Metabolism refers to all those chemical reactions, whether it's photosynthesis, and you ask about synthesis, biodegradation, various things like that, okay? We will talk a fair amount of the role of catalysts. You've done this in chemistry, you know about catalysts there, but we will talk about biological catalysts. Typically, uh, proteins, what are some examples of catalysts that aren't protein-based? From lecture this morning, RNA. So when Dr. Downer mentioned about translation and the linking of amino acids together in the process called translation, the actual molecule that does that is a molecule of RNA. So there's an example where it's doing catalysis, okay? There are a few examples of that, um, rather unique. And that's one reason why we think maybe the first life form was RNA-based, because it could do both catalysis, which is a required necessity, plus serve a role as a genetic material. The problem with RNA as genetic material is it is not very long-lived, okay? Now that we have DNA-based uh, genetic material, in terms of living things, it lasts a lot longer, okay? You can find DNA that's 100,000 years old and sequence it typically with uh, no, no difficulties. Living things are composed of cells, there's reproduction, and I put variation because we do typically have some variation that occurs through mutation or actually genetic shopping that we'll talk about when we do meiosis or gamete um, fertilization fusion that certainly introduces variation. And of course, DNA is the genetic material. You've seen or heard probably all of this before. Concepts by lab exercises. Uh, had a little lecture this time to talk a little bit about how these things will fit together. I think it's helpful for you to get a sense of where we're going. So first lab, safety and equipment. We're learning about equipment because the equipment allows us to gather information to answer specific biological questions. So the equipment we'll use will be micropipetters. I'll go over a demo of that shortly. I'm going to mention right now and again and again, always use a tip with the micropipetters. Can you write that down? Always use a tip, okay? Um, that allows us to get quantities as small as uh, one microliter pretty accurately, okay? So we get small volumes, we get specific reactions. When we do the PCR reaction, we will be using volumes as small as one microliter to do, to do the reaction. If you accidentally take 10 instead of one, it's not going to work, okay? So you want to know how to use them appropriately, so we'll go over that. Uh, we will have a way that you can actually test your skills, because you can weigh your samples. If, you know, if it was a mill, it should weigh a gram. If it's 100 microliters, you should weigh 0.1 grams. So you can actually test how good you are with microliter patterns. You'll learn how to use a spectrophotometer. Now, uh, in Chem 1A, have they started using the spectrophys spectrometers? They did? Okay, great. We work with them on that as well. That's the specs we use. So we're trying to get some classes that have some cohesiveness so that one set of equipment you use, you learn to use it again in another class. So you use specs to do an absorption spectrum to figure out concentrations of things and to measure reaction rates. We talked about catalysis and the role of you know, enzymes. We have a specific lab on that. So we will have an enzyme lab and use the spec to measure the rates. So that's why we have to learn about equipment. We'll use microscopes to look at cells repeatedly. So it's really important you learn how to use that microscope, okay? So we'll focus this lab on the uh, compound microscope, but later we'll use dissecting. This is that video isolation, the seawater, streaking it to make sure we end up with a 